Thank you, Robert. And I uh, just wanted to reiterate uh, the thanks that have been expressed uh, this morning to uh, all the organizers, the three organizers of these um, sessions over this past year. It's been uh, a really um, illuminating and wonderful experience to be a participant in these uh, events. The reception of medieval art has increasingly occupied scholars in recent decades. And within these manifold discussions, the notion of reading often emerges. Elizabeth Sears' heavy assessment of the state of the question finds historical weight in this notion. Um, for many view viewers clearly thought of the reception of art in terms of metaphors of reading, signaled in part by the ubiquitous presence of books in art, such as that of the Center of its Relief from Saint Remy. Now, taking the prompt of the present symposium, I want to briefly consider. This is an awful. You know, I'm with my voice. Um, taking the prompt of the present symposium, I want to briefly consider the problem of reading presented by a capital from the Benedictine, Benedictine monastery. <coughs> I'm particularly interested in how its monsters, out of keeping with the iconographic traditions from which its imagery draws, might guide and possibly obstruct the interpretation of its narrative imagery. In a central position, often reserved for an altar, in scenes of the sacrifice of Cain and Abel, a double-headed eagle cranes its neck toward each of the brothers who approach from either side. Above this monster, the pronounced diagonal articulated by the Dexter Domini unambiguously signals that Abel's sacrifice is acceptable, while the twofold symmetrical gaze of the eagle offers no Samson, or a David battling a lion. And then, um, just in the interest of full disclosure, this is the left side capital, which features a tree right behind Abel. Now, the juxtaposition of this capital scenes of sacrifice and struggle struck Arthur Kingsley Porter as odd and Neil Stratford as enigmatic, though neither um, scholar expanded upon their judgments. And the lengthiest study of the Muntia capital to date, um, Pearl Grove, suggested that a common moral theme of triumph over evil united the two figural scenes. Key to this argument was the identification of the scene at right uh, as Samson and the lion, a story interpreted in many people exegetical traditions as foreshadowing Christ's victory over evil. Linda Seidel, however, pointed to the unusual physiognomy of the quote unquote lion. Um, which has a scale uh, belly. It's a little hard to make this out, um, but it's uh, right in here. Scales. Uh, um, and a detail that she argued rendered this scene an analog to the Old Testament scene. Severe damage to this beast makes its original appearance unknowable, but the artist appears to have combined parts from two different animals just as he conjoined two ostensibly uh, unrelated scenes. Now, why did the Umuti sculptor simultaneously invoke and stray from pictorial traditions associated with King and Abel and um, Samson and David and the Lion? Exegetical conventions and reading strategies of monks provide a framework with which to pursue this question, but I suggest that such a textually informed notion of reading images cannot fully account for this carving of the idiosyncrasies. In addition to adopting metaphors taken from the activities of reading and Jesus, their connotations of legibility and intelligibility, I follow the lead of the contrary wise gaze of the eagle to consider an alternative scenario, namely that the car this carving's uh, various disjunctions perhaps aimed to sabotage or at least obstruct the reciprocal relationship between the visual narrative structure and the gears of the viewer's mental uh, machinery. In other words, we might consider how the Mutia monsters might generate meaning as well as how they resist being subsumed to a system of signification. Now, I begin with the scenario that the bicephalic eagle of the Mutia capital contributes to the meaning of this 
offering something akin to a gloss um, to the adjacent scenes of this sacrifice um, described in Genesis. Uh, to begin, um, churches throughout Burgundy, as we're all aware, showed preoccupation with stories um, from the Old Testament, such as this um, Samson and Lion in um, Isaiah 2. By and large, these narrative works largely conform to um, iconographic conventions, making it sometimes difficult to detect distinctively 12th century attitudes towards these subjects. For this reason, the Mutia capital is interesting, and that certain aspects of its imagery can be seen to foster a negative reading. Um, Broad, for one, persuasive of length, the presence of weeds nestled in Cain's um, offering, uh, highlighted by the inscribed um, uh, Cain with weeds of the way above um, in the inscription. Uh, two medieval polemics, um, including key texts by Augustine, the condemned Jews. The double-headed eagle can be read along similarly negative lines. Its monstrous presence in the position typically reserved for an altar in medieval iconography of the scene perhaps signals the otherness of the blood sacrifices, obviated um, for Christians um, by the crucifixion. The specific articulation of such an idea may have been informed by knowledge of, say, Roman altars, which occasionally feature eagles, including this example from Sardis. But I'm unaware of an ancient altar that features a double-headed eagle. Um, but the medieval sculptor may have emphasized his moralizing point by rendering the eagle monstrous through the addition of a second head. Um, for Romanesque sculptors often carve animals as white corporates or bicephalics, bicephalics as a way to make them monstrous. What is more, um, sculptors in Burgundy um, occasionally took pains to uh, situate Christian and pagan or Jewish rituals in relational terms, is on a portable shot view uh, that includes a tympanum uh, of, of the Last Supper. This carving of the originary moment of the Mass, a ritual performed within the walls of the church, sits atop a lintel that features um, a sacrifices of either the Old Testament or pagan sacrifices and so on. Now, sacrifice stands as a central theme of another capital from Moutier, also in the Fall Museum, that represents the Annunciation to Sacrifice. Riot. This custodian of the altar in the, temple, uh, in the temple swings a censer over the altar as he learns that his wife will give, uh, will give birth to John the Baptist. Viewed against the monstrous presence in the sacrifice of Cain, this imagery would likely prompt viewers to consider the relationship of on the mass to Old Testament um, sacrifices, lending a historical depth and complexity to the mass. Now, other readings of the Moutier eagle are likewise possible. Um, and for reasons of time, I can only suggest two here. First, uh, because uh, two head eagles were a motif of eastern silks, the Moutier creature might serve as a cynic, though, uh, for an altar call. In his extremely influential allegorization of the Mass, the 9th century theologian Amalarius of Metz argued that the altar cloth was a symbol of the soul's <coughs> purity. The altar embodies the mysteries of Christ and stands as the site of burnt offerings in reference to the end of sacrifice. The association of eagles with flight and apotheosis uh, further suggests this heavenward motion of the soul. The capitals, um, the Muti capital double-headed eagle perhaps underscores similar notions of sacrifice and salvation that is the be part of um, Christian doctrine. And second, there existed a strong geographic component to medieval teratology, <coughs> locating monsters at the far reaches of Europe, which is places like Ethiopia, um, as double-headed eagles were staples of the Eastern Mediterranean <coughs> silks, the Muti eagle might function as something akin to face markers, situating <coughs> on the sacrifice uh, narrative uh, in the East. Such a geographic gesture might be read in the wake of the tumultuous, tumultuous events of the fourth century, including the First Crusade and the official break between the Eastern and Western churches. As something akin to perhaps again to a negative gloss that became a naval narrative through the introduction of a motif associated with the Celtic and Byzantine empires. Yet, um, it is ultimately unclear what, <coughs> if anything, the motif evil signifies. Does its very much monstrosity offer, say, something akin to a negative form, <coughs> Jewish sacrifice, representing the figure of Cain, or through its potential allusions to ecclesiastical ornaments as a foster typological or materialized? <coughs> or even perhaps the geographic associations. 
This motifs undetermined quality lets these questions remain open. <coughs> Indeed, this very ambiguity may have been um, deemed desirable by the capitalist designer. <coughs> Regardless, any effort to specify the eagle's meaning should not obscure the remarkable gesture of placing a monster at the center of um, the Cain and Abel story. There's no precedent for this radical decision to my knowledge, which in part uh, remains inscrutable because of its very singularity. <coughs> Indeed, it may be that this double-headed eagle was not intended to signify at all. The use of this motif, a staple of luxury goods, perhaps serves to embellish a carving that decorated as God, while simultaneously drawing attention to the artifice of this carving. Accordingly, the capital manifests a self-consciousness, uh, and an early European example of what uh, Victor Stokita in another context has done with the quote, self-aware image. The capital salient aberrations from iconographic conventions draw attention um, to the activity of the sculptor, signifying um, that uh, his products are, are artifices. Aspects of the carving technique similarly invoke attention between verisimilitude and historicity on the one hand, and repetitive patterning and abstraction on the other. The careful articulation of the locks of wool on the sacrificial lamb or the exact rendering uh, shaft, uh, or the exactly rendering shafts of grain and veins on each of the eagle's fin, uh, feathers, gestures towards a naturalism at odds with the abstraction of their pattern arrangement. The lithic passages of the human faces, especially the abels, assert the materiality of, uh, of this carving. While the fantastically arranged drapery folds palpably signal that these figures are um, abstractions of the nature of history. But it is the presence of the two-headed eagle that is perhaps the most jarring because it is so clearly out of place. From an early date, Christian philosophers grappled with the um, constructedness or artificiality of human signifying systems. Augustine's sign theory, which exercised a profound influence in the medieval West, was an attempt to come to terms with and perhaps um, transcend the confines of language, itself a human construction. For example, his widely read De Doctrina Christiana argues that the literary aesthetic of the Bible, characterized by obscure images, forced the reader to seek out philosophical abstractions. Elsewhere in this text, Augustine argues that difficulties of reading scripture point to the frailties of human communication, which likewise inspired desire for the divine. Now, there's evidence that many 12th century monks um, would have sympathized with such views. The textual record associated with Moutier um, St. John is, is unfortunately very slim and shed little light on the intellectual culture of this institution. So I want to turn briefly to the sermons of Julian of Basil, um, a monk writing um, in the 1160s at an institution not far from Moutier, and among the few monastic collections um, from the 12th century, um, or collection of sermons that is, um, to have been edited in modern times. Julian uh, repeatedly bruised the frailties of human forms of communication and held a somewhat pessimistic view of the problems of interpreting um, obscure passages. At the outset of his sermon on Pentecost, um, for example, the monk laments the inescapable fact that he must rely on language, which, as man made, as man made is necessarily unreliable to communicate matters of the spirit. In a sermon, um, ostensibly celebrating the moment that the spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit supposedly overcame the limitations of human speech and understanding, Julian paradoxically foregrounds his belief that any attempt to convey spiritual things must be expressed in terms of um, human language, um, which necessitates a translation. Such a move necessarily results in impoverishment, impoverishments and misunderstandings. Julian likewise addressed the epistemology of vision at several points in his sermons. An imaginative engagement with the story of Epiphany, for example, tracks the vision of the Magi from mundane to spiritual seeing. This theme preoccupied medieval thinkers, and this has been explored in many um, elsewhere, including uh, figures such as Hugh St. Victor and um, Atticidio Saint Denis. But even so, Julian occasionally expressed doubts about the potentials of the sense of sight to transcend its corporeal nature. Most explicitly, this is the case um, in a sermon that takes as its prompt um, the 13th chapter of Mark. Um, the quote is, take ye heed, watch and pray. 
But the Dewey Rams of phraseology obscures the fact that Jerome's translation uses the imperative, more literally translated as see or witness. Following in the footsteps of Augustine, Julian takes this verse as a starting point for reflection on the limitations of corporeal vision. The monk ponders how the faithful can attain spiritual vision, and he describes the plight of the pious soul as follows. Quote, how can she, and here he's referring to the soul, understand the mysteries of God by the things that are made, who is surfeited and overwhelmed by the fantasies of corporeal things, which only the wealthy desire to accumulate, unquote. Now the first phrase Paul, uh, of this passage, upon paraphrases, Paul's frustrated desire to witness invisible truths, as voiced in Romans 1.20. But in his exegesis, Julian cast material objects um, as the principal uh, obstacle to spiritual seeing, what he calls corporeal fantasies. Now Thomas Dale has fruitfully an analyzed the notion of uh, fantasia at length within the context of medieval discussions of vision, ultimately arguing that Romanist sculptures allowed monks to purge sinful desires from their minds. He points to a celebrated relief uh, from the porch of uh, St. Pierre de Marzac um, that features the personification of lust, attacked by serpents and toads. But Dale suggests that this sculpture employs a strategy um, of inversion, the corporeality evoked by the salient articulation of forms in this carving prompted strong visions on the monastic viewer, but aimed ultimately at turning his attention toward the contemplation of um, matters of the spirit. Now, by contrast, Julian's use of fantasia, uh, he uses fantasia less in terms of the mechanics of, uh, say, the spiritual art of mind's art, and his signal on the illegibility um, of material objects, especially with respect to spiritual vision. In other words, the monk understands fantasia in ontological terms, and not in terms of epistemology or theories of vision in the mind. Now, Julian's um, desire to highlight the poverty and deceptions of corporeal fantasies may seem somewhat counterintuitive coming from a monk who lived in one of the most um, lavishly decorated monasteries in Northern Europe. Julian had, nonetheless, had something of an aesthetic streak, criticizing, for one, the palm of marble floors and painted ceilings and palaces. Although he did not launch a similar invective against church decoration, the monk's sermons repeatedly voiced profound anxiety over the enormous wealth that his community enjoyed, which he believed was at odds with our poverty central um, to the monastic vocation. More seems to be at stake for the monk than simply anxiety over the earthly riches of his community. For Julian voices concerned that quote unquote corporeal fantasies obscure the individual's vision of the divine, a central desire in the path of on the religious life. Later in his sermon, um, the monk builds upon a topos, particularly current among the Platonian theologians, that likens the soul to Zacchaeus, whose view of Christ's entry into Jerusalem was obscured uh, by the crowd, a metaphor of physical things. Only by ascending the sycamore tree, an action interpreted as jettisoning all worldly goods, could Zacchaeus see God. In addition to resonances with Adventist ceremonies, this theological tradition likely informed the many Antonian miniatures of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Many 12th century authors embraced um, positive aspects of the Augustinian notions of the sign, manifest in terms like intendimentum and invulcrum, and optimistically imagined the world in terms of, say, a book, which could be read to discover immutable spiritual insights. But Julian did not consistently share an optimism as he confronted limitations inherent in material signs, and the problems that that very materiality of those signs posed for spiritual understandings. Julian's musings on the limitations of human communication systems conforms to wider uh, trends of what um, Marie Dominique uh, described as, quote unquote, the self conscious use of metaphor and um, symbol in 12th century theology. Moreover, Julian's doubts articulated in sermons within a house that was an important priory of Cluny suggest that debates about the role of the visual arts um, cannot be so neatly drawn between, say, iconophilic Cluny and iconophilic Cistercians. 
or even patrons of the arts um, could be self-critical. Interest in um, the proper role of images can be felt elsewhere in 12th century culture. Um, Herbert Kessler, uh, for one, has recently documented this in relation um, to the next players, next poem, the neither God nor man teaches. Around 1096, Walter Dole penned the first known example of the statistic, which in various iterations have come to accompany the images of Christ across Europe, including an example here um, from San Miguel Stella. Kessler argues that this phraseology distills medieval image theory, for the image of Christ is not, uh, is not either God or man, but rather addresses a fundamental paradox central to the doctrine of incarnation, the immutable and transcendent encapsulated in the material and contingent. This paradox is ultimately irresolvable, but the dissimulation of the distich encourages a um, kinetic response in the view of the reader, which oscillates between um, those two uh, dual poles of Christ's nature. And to conclude, constructing the um, artifice of the Moutier capital, evidencing the inclusion of this bicephalic eagle, I, want, I wish to consider the possibility that uh, Romanist sculptors occasionally exploited the formal possibilities of the medium to specifically draw attention to the constructed nature of their representations. What might it mean to regard some Romanist sculptures as, quote, ringing with vibrant falsehood, unquote, to borrow Alan Field's paradoxical defense of the art of poetry as an appropriate and adequate vehicle for theological speculation. For Alan, knowledge of the um, divine is never fully apprehended by human reason, but is best, um, but can be approximated um, in one way to do that is through the of paradox. It might the falsehoods and artifices adopted by the Muti sculptors or signal perhaps a similar analogous effort to grapple with and perhaps transcend the communicative limitations of the sculptural medium. Thank you.